Hi, my name is Mel and uh, we're at BrickCan this year in Vancouver and uh, this year I've brought uh, two new bicycles with me. Um, so this is a 1960s Schwinn Stingray and it uh, was inspired by a bicycle that I saw in Spain last year um, and I thought you know that actually would be really cool to, um, to do after the other bikes that I had done and uh, I was doing some research on the history of it and it came to be because um, in the 60s so many people were customizing uh, regular pedestrian bikes into looking more like um, essentially motorcycles um, and so Schwinn kind of got the idea of uh, well maybe we'll make this into a consumer product um, and so uh, after the craze of um, this new release uh, Rayleigh actually jumped on that same uh, sort of hype and so within the decade Rayleigh then made the um, the, the chopper um, and so the chopper is slightly different than the the stingray in regards to um, a lot of people wanted to have a heavier bike so that could help with um, quick stops and uh, uh, being able to you know turn the bike very easily um, but then also with the weight of it they could um, you know race each other also crash each other uh, e each other's bikes into one another without um, causing too much damage to the frame um, and so there are certain features of these bikes that um, people will uh, easily recognize and so there's the um, handlebar um, so they call them like the the eight handlebars um, and then also the banana seat uh, and then we got the sissy bar at the back as well which is more of like a backrest for the chopper as opposed to the stingray which um, sort of just supports the seat um, that gives it enough um, shock and absorbance so that they can um, do tricks and, and all that kind of stuff with it and so um, for the stingray I wanted to give it more of this sort of beachy vibe and then for the chopper, I wanted to give this sort of cool, uh, essentially like a student who's maybe rebelling out of school, uh, leaving his backpack behind. He's got a little boom box with some cassettes and um, very uh, Stranger Things inspired as well. Uh, so, you know, kind of ditching the, the homework behind and going on some adventures instead. Um, yeah, and... and you know, building bikes has kind of become my thing now, and so I feel like I'm kind of getting these out a little bit faster than I usually do. Um, but my hope in every model is to make sure that I put as much detail and accuracy to the original ones as possible. Um, still some things that I'm learning, so um, I still don't have any chains on any of the bikes, and that's just because trying to figure out how I could do that with LEGO is still... Um, too heavy for the model and so it does um, actually affect the balance of it um, but both of these models are the first freestanding bikes that I've made whereas the other two uh, we needed the lamppost to support the weight. So you were able to, to support these in a way that they can just stand up on their own then. Talk a little bit more about how you achieve that because yeah when you first look up at walk up to these they look very fragile like they wouldn't be able to stand up on their own. Yeah, so I did um, pretty much extended like a kickstand underneath both of them and that actually um, holds the bike in place and the weight's so distributed on the frame that um, I didn't have to worry about um, anything sort of weighing heavier on one side than the other and I made sure that it was uh, pretty symmetrical um, uh, to, from the, the back and from the front. Um, other than that, it's really just making sure that um, I wasn't, at least with the other models, um, I was putting most of the weight into um, the frame as opposed to the tires. And so these ones here, the weight actually is mostly t um, tires, kickstand, um, it, yeah, actually um, uh, front and back tires and kickstand. Um, and that's how they're able to, to hold themselves up. Um, but if I was to put, you know, they're actually quite sturdy. I think this one here I could probably move a bit. Yeah, they're quite sturdy even though they might jiggle a bit. Um, and that's just because there's flex tube throughout most of the thing kind of holding it all together. Um, so even though they, they, they look frail because of the delicacy of the, of the frame and, and how thin I've chosen to do it. But um, in comparison to the prettiest, pretty previous models, they actually are quite sturdy. Um, and the fact that they can hold themselves up means that there's not too much weight that's actually um, uh, being put onto the, the frame itself. Right. Another detail that certainly catches your eye is the, the wheels and tires themselves on these bikes. So talk about the pieces you used on each of these and, and how you were able to achieve that. 
Yeah, so the main tire that I'm using is just a, like a Technic uh, wheel that Lego created years ago. And so I've ordered a bunch of those, and, and that's where I sort of um, start the... Um, the bike from and, and sort of build the scale of it based on those tires um, because the chopper has a front wheel that's smaller um, I had to pretty much improvise by creating a brick built tire and in, in this case I just uh, wrapped four layers of treads around each other um, to give it that same thickness and then it didn't look too um, too different um, and then I fill them with brick um, and try to keep the color consistent and so I was able to use um, like a Technic wheel in there, but then keep the color consistency of gray and red on both sides. And that sort of makes them look like they actually belong to the same bike as opposed to being so different. Um, some of the previous models I have, I use a larger Hellfire Droid tire, but for this scale and for this size of bike, the smaller black one actually fit it so much, so much better. And it certainly gives a great look to the bike. Another really cool part of these is how you're able to use the rounded pieces and, you know, strange angles on the yellow one here, the way that they slope down and move around like that. So that's not always easy to do with Lego and actually keep it strong. So what pieces did you use there? How did, how did that come together? Well, the great thing about um, any of the round curved bricks is that obviously they don't have any flexibility because it is um, ABS plastic. But um, once you fit something like a flex tube in it um, and you don't tighten them so close to one another you actually can get quite some quite nice curvature from it um, and so I usually use like two by two round bricks in order to hold a lot of the main um, framing of the of the bike. So anything that's underneath the seat or an, underneath the handlebars, it's going to have something to 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 hold that weight. Um, but any uh, curvature that I'm doing or any sort of framing that I'm trying to replicate, it is best with with just the one by one round brick. Um, and that yeah, that's what I've pretty much done consistently in trying to create a frame that's not too thick that actually is accurate to the the sizing of the in, in scale to the sizing of the real original uh, model and you mentioned the scenes you made earlier talk about some of the other items you've got around here because you're able to achieve this really great sense of story almost just by placing a few different items around the bikes that kind of give an idea of what you were going for yeah, I seem to keep this theme of using um, some sort of radio. Um, I had a gramophone on a previous model as well. I just want, I think music is so important for people over the decades that um, everyone has had a radio that looks like something like this for um, in, in their lifetimes. The boombox is the most recognized one. And so um, a lot of people had this in the 60s and 70s. And, and then it, it's such a, a cool product that most people actually kept it in for the rest of their um, uh, adult, like young adult life. So in the 80s and 90s, you'd still see these sort of um, uh, being used around. Uh, and cassettes were still very much uh, relevant during that time. And so um, I felt like it kind of just worked to have a cassette player that um, sort of represented this scene. And so this model of Boombox was actually invented in the 60s. And then there's very, um, very... Uh, uh, different models and different types that have um, come up over the years. Um, and so I really wanted, just because this this bike represented coolness at the time, I wanted to make sure that the accessories that went in it were just as cool. Um, but it, that whole storytelling, like you, you mentioned that I like to do, that's where the backpack comes into play because it's, you know, trying to represent what kind of what kind of targeted group is this and it's it really was just young boys that were in school um but didn't really care for it um and then with the schwing just because of the colors that i chose i felt and, and because i saw it in spain i felt like giving it a beach scene just made sense for this model and so i chose a, a radio of that generation um and then the little goodies and the cooler and, and the little cans of coke or the bottles of coke um are just some typical things that you'd usually bring to the beach yeah and they add so much nice detail there so excellent work here mel i'm glad you've continued with the the bike scenes and for people watching if you haven't seen mel's past interviews we'll make sure to put links to them in the description on some of her past fantastic work uh, that she's done so thank you so much for bringing it out to brick can here and for talking to me about it thanks guys appreciate it